a man of many talents. He uh, is an author, co-author of The Joy of Closure. Um, he uh, has, am I making all that noise? Yes. Ask me the mic. All right. Um, so yes, he is an author. He uh, currently has uh, an epic number of worthwhile books on a service called Goodreads. Uh, just more books than you could ever possibly read in a lifetime. I don't know how he does it. Um, he has his own Lisp implementation, Foger. Uh, <laughs> he, keep an eye on that. Uh, but but most, most impressively, I think, this is the only person I know with his own emoticon, <laughs> which he uses to sign emails and books. So if you get your book signed, you can find out what that looks like. And he will tell us the secrets of the macronomicon. So one day the acolyte came to the master macrologist and seeking wisdom. Uh, the macro, uh, macrologist's name was Pai Mu. And he saw the acolyte coming and he knew that, that, that he sought knowledge and he said to him, stop. What is the true power of the macro? And in, in an act of thoughtfulness, the acolyte stuck his finger to his chin. And immediately, Pai Mu brandished the knife and cut the finger off. <clears throat> and of course, as you can imagine, the acolyte screamed in pain and, and, and cried and gnashed his teeth. And he, and he said, this guy's crazy. I got to get out of here. So he started running and Pai Mu said, stop. I ask you again, what is the true power of the macro? And the acolyte went to place his finger at his chin again, and the finger was gone, and he was enlightened. <laughs> so, as a child, uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time on the Commodore 64, and I probably betray myself as a child of the leisure class that I had this, 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 um, this, this luxury. And one of the early programs that I wrote was a baseball statistics calculation program. And, and one of the nice things about this was that um, uh, we would play games in the neighborhood. And then I'd run home and I'd type in every, all of the statistics that my friends and I had accumulated throughout the day. And then we could, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could see how we were doing over the course of the summer. And the, the nice part about this program was it would, it would store the, the new games in memory. Uh, and then at the end, when we quit, it would dump it out to disk, everything. And then so the next time that the program loaded, um, it had all of the statistics that we had entered and, and all previous uh, statistics. And, and so that was really my, my first exposure to a program writing program. And that is exactly why I'm here today. And as Stuart mentioned, I did write a book, uh, but that's less important. So yeah, we're talking about program writing programs. And, and for anyone with, a, with some number of experience in the computer industry, uh, you've come across programs that write programs. And, and, and some examples, you know, uh, to more or lesser extents, they, they give you uh, that, that capability. But these are tools. And really what I'm talking about is language level program manipulation. So let me talk a, about a little bit about some of uh, the popular cases. And, and so I will start with, with C. Um, and, and, and C, uh, a long time ago, had, had an interesting property. And so you could, you could, you could define a preprocessor directive uh, from any, uh, any r random sequence of characters. And so what that means is that you could, you could uh, replace any uh, any block, any string of code in your, in, in your program with, with, with anything. And so this was crazy, I mean, unbelievably crazy. So th th there was, this was causing all kinds of problems. So they, they, they thought of a fix, and instead they, they, they limited it to, uh, rather than random strings of, of, of characters, it was more along of a, uh, 
expression. And so uh, what, this, what this allowed you to do is describe uh, preprocessor directives that, that, could, that could be direct replacements in your program text. Uh, but there were problems with this because uh, the replacement, the way that it parsed, was very different from the intent. Uh, whereas the intent was more along this line. So uh, every C programmer knows that in order to get around this, you just jam a bunch of parentheses around everything. <laughs> and so eventually you'll, you, you'll get this right. But it's not exactly right because you can have, you can have expressions that, that cause side effects. And so all bets are off when this happens. There's not a lot you can do here. I mean, I, I'm sure that someone's figured this out, but it's, it's, I got out of C a long time ago, and, and I haven't been following the, the state of the art in crazy preprocessor directives. Um, but there are other things that give the same kind of behavior, but in a, in a slightly different way, and one is C++. And uh, everyone's heard of the term template metaprogramming. And, 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 a, and an, interesting, uh, an interesting example of that is a factorial that occurs within the templates of, of a C++ program. So at compile time, the uh, factorial of, of, a, of a constant is, is calculated and outputted. So this is pretty good. But C++ gets, uh, allows you to do this in a number of ways, giving you a number of tools. And one is it has values. Uh, another is it gives you functions, uh, uh, branching type things, and recursion. And you know this, this is starting to smell like Turing completeness to me. And, and, and you, I have a little rant that I like to give about Turing completenesses. And, and, and if you're on the internet, you know that uh, any conversation about programming languages eventually devolves into a talk about, well, this language is Turing complete, and so it can do anything that other language can do. And of course, to an extent, that's right. But I mean, even though that's not the exact meaning of Turing completeness, but um, the, the meaning is known. Uh, the, and, and so, but there's a problem with that, and there's a problem, the problem is one of diminishing returns. And, and so, even though this may be Turing complete, you wouldn't want to write a spreadsheet program in this. So let's talk about OCaml for just a moment. And OCaml uh, is actually very interesting. It's much more interesting than these other two that we talked about, because uh, given a, a, a piece of OCaml code, you can manipulate, you can deal with that in one of two ways. You can deal with it directly like this, or you can deal with it as, a, as an AST. And so what, but no one wants to write their, their OCaml in this way, so they really want to deal with this. So what OCaml gives them is a quoting mechanism. But what's kind of special about the quoting mechanism is that it has a tag, and the tag describes a processor for that bit of code. And so, um, this is actually very interesting because you can get a lot done with this and you can do some very interesting things with syntax with this, o, with this OCaml mechanism. But um, there's a, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a this is, you're, you're dealing with OCaml at a level that is, is, is not the way you would typically deal with, with OCaml code. But that's not why we're here. We're not talking about OCaml. We're talking about Lisp. And specifically, we're talking about Lisp macros. <laughs> <clears throat> so last year, Christoph gave a, a great talk. I thought it was a fantastic talk. Um, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and I don't want to libel the talk by, by oversimplifying it. I, I really suggest you go and check it out. But, uh, it, at its essence, it boils down to, to, to the use cases of macros, legitimate use cases of macros. And one would be creating binding forms, another creating control flow, and then some icing at the end. So if I mip, misrepresent you, Christoph, please just, just bear with me. There's a point to this. Uh, but before I get into uh, dealing directly with this, I want to talk a little bit about the history. And uh, so, you know, we saw this. The very first talk of the day had this in it. Uh, and and this, is, this is the original Lisp eval. Um, and it dealt with 
with, uh, you know, basically one tiny increment above the lambda calculus. So uh, it's interesting, but it's, it could be more interesting. And, and, and there was a man named Timothy Hart who came along, and, and there's, this, there's a PDF out there, and it's, just, it's incredibly blurry. It's very hard to read, but in it he describes a macro uh, capability that extends that type of eval with a little bit more. And if, if you look at the end, you'll see that uh, it, it now handles a macro form. And a macro in, in, in this early form is a function of one argument that takes a data structure and spits out a data structure. As simple as that. Um, and, but the real key is right here, eval, eval. And so on the first, e in the inner, inner eval is when the manipulation happens within the function. The second eval evals the, the, the results of that manipulation. So that's kind of cool. I have a, I have a lisp online that does this. It's really stupid. Um, but, so macros are kind of cool, but in the cases that Christoph described, you don't really need macros. In fact, if you have a language with lightweight function literals or blocks, you can do that stuff without ever dealing with a macro. And so, for example, in, a con in the case of control flow, uh, the, the, a, a similar Ruby uh, equivalent would just deal with a block, and, and, and it works uh, effectively the same way, I guess. Uh, and, and likewise for bindings, taking a, a sequence and, and binding a number, a number of names to it, corresponding to elements within the sequence, is, is, is likewise fairly straightforward. And, and, and it looks just as clean as the macro case. Um, so control flow and binding, maybe not uh, a compelling case for macros. Just maybe, let's bear with me. So what about icing? What about the icing part? Well, there are other languages that provide a great level of, of, of icing uh, slathering on your language, and one is Scala. And I wrote a, I wrote a Scala, uh, I want to quote this, DSL, um, that is my greatest contribution to the Scala community <laughs> ever. Um, and it, this is Scala code. This is Scala. This is not basic. This is Scala. And so using all kinds of tricks and, and, and evil, I managed to coerce Scala into looking like this. Um, but there's a problem with this. I mean, uh, besides the obvious. Um, and, 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 and it is that, that you're not really dealing with basic. It's the pieces of Scala just poke through. And, and for example, there's some symbols laying around here, and, 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 and there's some implicit conversions happening, and, and, and uh, you know, there's some closures over here, and, and, and some map lookups, and it's all held together with this kind of like trampoline at the end. And, 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 and while this is a great thing, uh, <laughs> I mean, outstanding thing, uh, it, it suffers from something we call the mapping dilemma. And, and, and I, I give a picture of this book because it, to me it perfectly describes the mapping dilemma. And, and, and in this book there's a, there's a story called The Man Who Came First. It's, it's the greatest time travel story I've ever read. And, and in it, uh, a man goes back in time, you know, not that long, uh, long enough so that uh, even though he knows the language and he knows some of the cultural aspects uh, of the time that he's, he's put into, no matter how hard he tries, his, his own prejudices just sort of poke through. And that causes constant friction. So it's that poking through of, of, of the underlying, uh, I, I don't know, mores that, that, that sort of describes a mapping dilemma. Uh, but I won't talk a lot about that. I mean, other people have talked about this. Uh, but I want to go back to the, the, these use cases that, that we started off with. And although these these may be legitimate use cases for macros. I have other ideas. I mean, a great man once said uh, that, that you know, anything you can do with macros uh, are legitimate. But, it's, it, but bear in mind, I mean, this, is, this should go without saying that it's all a matter of cost-benefit analysis. So while I say this, uh, it's a double-ended gun. Be careful. 
So let's think of some other ways that we can use macros. And I'll add to this the, the list. And one would be uh, adding abstraction, um, transformation, optimization, which is really sort of a, a, a subcategory of transformation, and true power awesomeness. Uh, basic would be an example of true power awesomeness. <laughs> but let's think about this for a second. Uh, any <laughs> anytime, this is gratuitous, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Uh, Any time you want to define a macro, uh, you, have to, you have to go through a... I, I like to go... I don't, I'm not going to prescribe anything. This is what I do. Uh, what do I want? What the heck am I trying to do? So just for a small example, I want a way to define local bindings. This sounds very familiar. I, I, I'm sure you're, you're aware of something called let. Um, but really, do you need a macro? Uh, in this case, yeah, but I'm going to just briefly describe a different thing. I have a library called, called um, UNC that is just a, uh, a memoization library. And, and it was really tempting to make uh, the, 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 memo, the memoization builder a, a macro that just looked kind of nice. But really, it was just, it was just a, f a function that took some, some functions and returned a function. And so that's exactly what it is didn't really need a macro in that case, uh, so I didn't use it. Um, so the next, next thing to think about that I think about is, what does it look like? So that's always where I start. If I'm trying to do something, I write the thing that I want, the, the, the greatest thing that I can think of that I, that I want when dealing with macros. And then when you do that, how does it actually work? So this is just, this is just a nested uh, if, you, if you know JavaScript, this is, this is very familiar. Uh, just a nested function calls that, that uh, pass in the arguments and, and provide proper scoping. And so, uh, once you've really gone through this thought process, what's left to do? Just type. Just start typing. <laughs> and eventually, the implementation will come out. <clears throat> so that's it. That's, that's the whole thought process. But one side note. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Uh, one, one thing that I, that I do want to mention is that that was kind of ugly. I mean, that's not how we do it in Clojure. We, we do it slightly differently. So, you know, our binding forms look, uh, you know, they're, they're paired uh, implicitly. So, uh, you know, to get that, it's just a, a partition two away. But that, that's, we all know that by now. You've read the book. <laughs> so, okay, I, I wasn't going to put this into the talk, but I, I couldn't control myself given, given our illustrious audience members. And so um, I am going to talk a little bit about hygiene and closure, although this is a matter of, of ongoing research. And uh, you know, this guy agrees with this guy, but he disagrees with that guy, and, and so on and on. And, and so we never really get an answer to the hygiene problem, not yet. Uh, but hygiene can be described in, in a real simple way uh, that is, well, it's, it's, it's a few words, whether or not it's simple is another matter. Uh, but I just want to give an example of, of how closure uh, deviates from hygiene. And, and the degenerative case one is just a simple uh, macro that returns some keyword when, when the thing it's given is truthy. So the problem here, of course, is that um, in this naive implementation, if you have a var that's defined somewhere, uh, and, and this macro is run somewhere else, it's going to give you the wrong answer. Um, the problem is because the, uh, the way that closure works, the symbols are expanded to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, qualified. And, and so there was a problem with the original implementation, which is easily fixed. But this is, this is definitely a case of, of hygiene that you might hear uh, used on the use on, on, on Usenet, perhaps. So scheme, schemers are always saying things like, oh, well, proper tail, tail calls and, and, and hygiene and un unhygienic. And they use it in this sense, uh, and this is definitely true, where hygiene means clean and unhygienic means dirty or rotten. And, 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 and that's, that's, uh, you, you, can, you can make a case for that. But there's a different sense of hygiene, I think, which is illustrated in the degenerative case, too which is where 
you're doing uh, something like an AWIN where, where the definition of, of, of a local it is, is available within the body. And so um, it's sort of magic the way this happens. But uh, it's not really. It's just you're breaking hygiene for a specific purpose. And, and so um, now you've still shadowed the original, uh, an original definition of, of it. But you've done it in a, in, in a, in a kind of a weird way. Uh, it's, not, it's not textually obvious what's happening here. And so that's part of the problem with this. So in closure, we, use it, we do a slightly different thing where we, we provide binding forms when we're trying to do this kind of stuff. And that, that, that solves that particular problem. But there is, there is a use, uh, even though it might be small, and, and, and it's not, uh, it only happens maybe once twice in, in closure core itself where you want to break hygiene. Uh, but that's a definitely a different sense of hygiene where it's more uh, you know, a sanitized versus rolling up your sleeves to get stuff done. Uh, to, so providing that window into unhygienic behavior. But you know, that's just a side note. Really what, what I'm going to talk about is the use of macros and a little bit of the, the abuse. And so uh, I, I used the word DSLs earlier, and, and I quoted it, and there was a reason for that, because a lot of what we're doing, I don't really agree, are DSLs. And because DSLs uh, created as, uh, as embedded DSLs especially um, are very, very hard. And not only are they very hard, but they're very hard to make robust, and they're very hard to make uh, so that the, the, impl the, the language details don't bubble up to the top. And they're very hard to make, uh, uh, that, that prov provide useful error messages. So I really don't want to talk about DSLs in this talk. But what I want to talk about, and this is what macros, I think, are great at, are creating MSLs, which are mood-specific languages. <laughs> and so I didn't, I didn't invent this term, but I, I like it. And, and basically what it means is, we want to be able to uh, write uh, a language that makes sense within a given context. And, and, and the, the way that it's used in, in uh, Puimarda's papers is very, very uh, restricted within, within block context. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, trying to create a language that makes sense within a certain context. And one, one example is a, a library that I created called Trammel that has exactly zero users. Uh, not including myself. And so I went through that, that process I described earlier, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but I think it's useful to enumerate the things that uh, I wanted to get done. And one was a new pre-post syntax. Another was a decomplected contract from uh, functions. Uh, I wanted invariant on records and types and references, uh, and definitely better error reporting, and some other stuff that it's unimportant. Uh, but really, did I need a macro? And the answer is yes. And the reason is uh, for a specific thing. And, one, and it's called second class forms. Is any, if, if you're unfamiliar with second class forms, it can be described easily. Um, for any language uh, that is above the pure lambda calculus, there's something called a second class form. And in the case of, of Haskell, perhaps, would be maybe a, I don't know, a type annotation. But in closure, uh, and in specifically the case of Trammel, it's this pre and post map. Now what that means is you can't get the pre and post map in there as the result of an expression. It disappears. It disappears at compile time and, 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 and does, and, 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 and adorns the function that, that, uh, that, that it's attached to. So this is a great example. I mean, uh, I can sit and I can say, I can pitch on the, the mailing list and say, hey, I think that, that pre and post conditions should look like this instead of this. And so uh, I can do that round and around and around. But really, why should I? I have macros. Why do I need to wait for Rich to do that? I have the power. He gave me the power, and I'm going to abuse it. I mean, use it. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I use macros to provide a new kind of pre post syntax. It's a little bit, I mean, it's a little bit more. Uh, com compressed. I mean, it, 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 and, and it's this little vector that's hanging off at the end of the arg list. 
And so for a, a, a square function, it just describes that the square function accepts a number that's not equal to zero and produces a positive number. Simple. Uh, well, I should maybe hesitate using that word. It's easy. <laughs> so another thing that I really wanted, and this, is, this was more important to me than the other thing, and I could have done, I could have just used the regular uh, syntax, but I wanted decomplected contracts. I wanted to define a function and then later on uh, apply a contract to it. And, and this is kind of what it looks like. You know, if you're doing uh, the Gregorian last day of month calculation, uh, there are certain things, you can, you can write that, and in a completely separate place, you can write the contract for it, or you can do it right underneath, it doesn't matter. Uh, it'll find out where it is, and it'll, it'll apply the contract after the fact. Uh, a third thing that I wanted were record invariants. And uh, both this and the other thing do some really evil stuff that we can talk about later. But uh, the, the, I, it, the fact that Clojure even allowed me to do this is just astonishing. But that other stuff has nothing to do with macros. But this is, uh, I, I, th I think this is somewhat lacking in, in, in the, the way that Clojure handles pre and post conditions. But again, I didn't, it doesn't matter because I have the power to add this if I want it. And so finally, I wanted better error, error reporting. At the moment, if a precondition fails, it just it throws an assertion exception. But I really wanted to know if it was a pre or post condition. I really wanted to know, uh, I wanted to be able to assign blame, uh, you know, which, fu which function through this or what function through that. And, and at the moment, it's kind of a hack the way I do that. But with with new f capabilities that seem to be coming down the pipe, like load-bearing exceptions, I think I can get uh, more context contextual information out of that. But um, there, is a, there is a technique that I use throughout this whole library, and, and, and actually it's used a lot, uh, and, and that I find simple, simplifies the matter of writing macros, and I like to call it piecewise transformation. So if you look in um, the Trammell source, you'll see this kind of pattern throughout, and you'll actually see this pattern in the closure core uh, also, where you, you disassemble a, 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 a data structure that comes in, such as a body, which is just a, a data structure that comes into a macro, and it's, it's incrementally manipulated uh, in pieces and, and, and eventually uh, built back up into the thing that the macro is producing. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can even go in the closure core and see how this is done in, in, in death multi. This is just a, a, a piece of, uh, of, of that macro. Uh, but in, in the book, I talk a little bit about uh, a macro called as futures. Uh, but I don't go into this, this piecewise transformation at all. Uh, but the premise is you, you have this macro and an action uh, that produces a result, and the actions are distributed over some number of futures. And then afterwards, after they're done, you can, you can use the results uh, in, in a body. Uh, so uh, a use of this might look like this, which is, which is you know, not, not all that compelling, but it, it, it's simple, it fits on the slide. But if you want to sum the factorials of a bunch of numbers, you can distribute that ac across a number of futures and, and, and deal with the result. But the important part is the implementation, and specifically in the let. And, and, and what, what I've done is I've sort of split it up and dealing with the left-hand side and the right-hand side in different ways, uh, and then reassembling them into the, 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 the body. And, and what I always try to do when I'm writing macros, and I don't always succeed, it's, it's actually a little bit difficult uh, to do, is to try to get the last thing in the macro to look exactly like the thing that it should be when it comes out. And it's not, a, it's, it's for, it doesn't apply to every macro because they're all different and, and some are more complex than others. But what this approach allows me to do is something I like even more. And that allows me to, along this uh, piecewise transformation, to attach functions, uh, validation functions, on the parts and report errors on the bits and pieces of the, of, of the transformation along the way. So this is, this, you know, you, maybe you could experiment with this, or maybe you have a different way for writing macros. But I found this very, a very good way from, for me to, um, to wrap my head around what was going on. 
But back to trammel. So what, what is underneath of trammel? And this is really what the, the beauty of Christoph's talk is. And, and, and he says that for any macro, make sure that your base is solid and you're building on something that, that is, is composable, that makes sense, and, and, and that's exactly what I'm trying to get by, by here. And this, this, is, this is teased out in something that I, I want to call the primacy of semantics. And, and what that means is uh, the most imp perhaps the most important thing in any program is that it does what it's supposed to do. And regardless of any other thing, uh, that, that's, that's what we should focus on. And a long time ago, you know, a great computer scientist talked about this specific thing. So at the bottom is something called, I like to call a contract, which is the simplest thing in the world. Um, minus some, some crazy web of try-catch that I build uh, that I'm not showing here that, that assigns blame. But uh, at, at, at its essence, it's just this simple thing that's a function that takes a function and some number of arguments uh, that, has a, that has the pre and post conditions attached and that delegates out to, an origin, to another function. And so what this allows you to do is a constrained function is just the partial application of the contract with the function that you're trying to constrain. And what's kind of cool about that is you can then piecewise compose these things one after the other. So you can take a piece of a contract here and a clause of a contract there and bang them together, apply them to a function, and it just works. But one thing, an, another thing that I actually like even better than that is it provides contracts on higher order functions. And so uh, I can, uh, with, this, with this macro, I can define uh, the constraints on a function that take a function and define the con constraints on the function that that function takes. If that made any sense, uh, you deserve a cookie. Um, so yeah, that's all it does is it describes a uh, in-place contract and that uh, during that delegation, prior to the function going in to the, the function under constraint, it applies a contract. It's as, it's as simple as that. But the cool thing about all of this, and it would be worthless if, if, if I couldn't do this, is that given a single command, it all goes away. It just disappears. So that's kind of cool. That's, that's actually something that macros are very, very good at. And we can think of other cases of this. And for example, um, logging statements. If you, if you have a macro that provides a logging capability, um, you definitely want to have that during your, your uh, development and, and perhaps staging uh, modes. But you might want to turn it off at production. And macros give you that switch. So let's talk a little bit about programs, writing programs, writing programs. And to illustrate this idea, I want to talk about another library that I have called MinderBinder. Uh, and MinderBinder was sort of uh, influenced by another language called Frink. Uh, and if you're familiar with Frink, uh, great. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful language. But if you're not, go check it out. It's, it's really an awesome thing. And, and one thing that it does is that it defines, it, it deals with units and unit conversions at a, in a first class way. So unit conversions are, you know, if you go to the NIST uh, website, they have these huge documents about uh, unit sizes and how they relate to each other and base units. And so there, there's one way of, of writing a library that provides unit conversions. It's just to write a bunch of functions you know, meters to feet or meters to yards or whatever. And you just, just, just keep typing. Never stop typing. Because you will never stop typing if, you, if you're trying to do it this way. So, you know, you get your unit conversions, feet to meters, and, but then what if you want to do centimeters to shackles or rams and chains to fathoms? Um, what if you want to do abbreviations? Uh, what about if there are different kinds of conversions you want to do? I mean, you see where this is going, right? And so do you ever feel like you're being boilerplated alive? I do. I do often. I'm working in Rails. <clears throat> so one thing, when you're, when you're dealing with boilerplate, one thing that, that, that you, there's, there's a consideration. And, and, and I'm going to 
talk a little bit about velocity. And since I'm dealing with velocity, we're talking about uh, a number of tasks uh, over unicorns. <laughs> so you do a task once, it takes a certain amount of unicorns. The second time you do it, it takes a less number, lesser number of unicorns. So if a, if a third time comes along and you say, well, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe I can, maybe I can eliminate that boilerplate in some way. This is where macros can, can help you. And although the third time may be longer than the second time, I would say that in subsequent uh, number of, of, of implementations, it's actually going to save you a lot of time over the long, a lot of unicorns over the long haul. So if we're talking about semantics, maybe the best thing to describe a library of the, the kind that, that I wanted Minder Binder to be would, would be to just look at the specification and, and uh, you know, just type out all those functions. I mean, here it is. It's right here. This is exactly, this tells me everything I need to know. But that's, that's less than satisfying because, um, really, this specification can be used directly. He just puts parentheses around the specification. And that's exactly what I did. I, I took that specification and I sort of manipulated it in a little way and made it look somewhat like uh, closure code might look. And this, is, this leads into something I like to call the primacy of syntax. I didn't, I didn't invent any of this. All of these terms are someone else's. I'm just stealing them. And John Schutt, the, the author of the kernel language, talked about this. But it boils down to this. Anything that Anything in a language that is semantically useful and, use, and, and used uh, systematically can eventually find its way to the level of syntax. And, and, and even Java does that. Uh, it just takes a while. And so um, I wanted to design a, a, a syntax that went along uh, with the semantic meaning of these, these uh, specifications. But really, what are we dealing with here? We're not, we're not, syntax is nice, but really we're dealing with data. And it's just data, it's all data. And Rich talked about this yesterday and, and he's thought about this a lot harder than I have, but um, the fact that the, the code is data, I'm not going to use the word homoiconicity, but the fact that macros deal on the level of data and the data is, uh, corresponds to source is the whole reason that, that I'm giving this talk. Uh, and, and, but there's more to it than just macros, as Rich said. You could, it, it provides a, a system that is queryable and that you can attach metadata to. So this is a very powerful idea. And, and, and there's two ways to approach this. You, can, uh, you see it even in, in something like Leiningen that, that takes the specification of a project and feeds it into an engine that does some stuff. I mean, that's data. So, the length specification is data, and if you squint a little bit, it comes out. I mean, there's some, there's some data hidden in there. So Minder Binder uses that data to build up some interesting behavior. So let me ask a quick question. What's the fastest way to multiply two numbers? Anyone have an idea? What is that? Uh, that's pretty fast, yeah. Um, but there's an even faster way. You just take the answer and you put it there. <laughs> <clears throat> now whether that occurs as the, as the result of a table lookup, is, is, there's a distinction there. With macros, that lookup can happen before the code ever executes. It's happening at compile time, and that's exactly what I tried to do. And so I created a, uh, I messed up, I created an MSL uh, called def units of that takes that specification as uh, a base unit uh, and, and, and provided uh, a description of the unit conversion. So uh, within a meter, there's a, there's a certain number of inches, which is a fractional value, uh, and a foot is, is, is 12 inches. And so it's sort of, you know, uh, it's interrelated. And, and this, this, exact, this, this, this MSL is motivated by a, let, a, a book called Let Over Lambda. Uh, and it's a, a bit of this is in, in the joy of closure too, but um, I really thought that this was a powerful idea. So what, what, what this gives us is the result 
the result of that is a map. And the map is flattened, and, and, and the meter is equal to one meter. That's the base unit in inches. And, it's, and it all relates back through some compilation time manipulation. And that map is then fed in and results in another macro. And now that macro is just a lookup. So given your unit and a quantity, it does a multiplication at compile time. And it's used like this. And what comes out? The answer. The answer comes out. This is all happening at compile time. So I've taken this specification and reduced it to a value. And now if I want to, I can generate all of those feet to meters and blah, 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 uh, which the bodies are just constants. Uh, and, if, and if I really wanted to, which I probably will, if I wanted to go from one kind of unit to another, that's typically the result of a function. So then you can jam all this stuff together and you can create, uh, I wouldn't say something as, as comprehensive as Frink, but you can get something that's pretty nice and that's what I'm shooting for. Um, so I can't believe I actually had enough time. So if you want to learn more, uh, there's some books that talk about this kind of stuff and there's some papers and, and websites and you can view my source. Uh, these slides will be available after the talk. And so, um, yeah, I want to say thanks to everyone, especially uh, Rich and Closure Core, but also uh, my colleague Jamie Kite, who really took uh, a mountain, a uh, cyclopean mountain of slides, and turned it into something that was worth looking at. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of other people I want to thank. And, and, and thank you. That's it. <laughs>